Welcome to Polycast, a civilization podcast focused on game strategy. Dan Q. Makalua. The me and team. Ed Jin. With guest co-host, Dojo Boy. You guys are way too comfortable with each other. <laughs> <laughs> See what happens at night. Yeah. You haven't seen or heard anything yet. You ain't seen nothing yet. I'm a Dan Q, and I'm joined by Mackie. I got confused because you didn't have to hit the live button this time. <laughs> <laughs> the main team. I create technical ease. Imagine. What? 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 <laughs> no, Phil. <laughs> and. <laughs> what? <laughs> Our guest co host, Dojo Boy. Hello, everyone. The reason why I'm doing the introduction to this episode as opposed to Dojo Boy, which is our tradition on this show, you have a guest to do the introduction, is because I want to acknowledge a record that you have now set on this show. And by setting a record, I mean shattering the previous one by more than double. So this is impressive. You are returning six years, four months, and 169 episodes later. <laughs> Whoa. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I've been there in spirit. You were one of three guests on episode 65 in March of 2009. The previous record holder for in-between guest appearances was Troy Goodfellow at 75. To be at 169, you really have messed with the average here, and I approve. I'm, I'm, I'm writing that down. <laughs> He's like before my time. Before Imagine? Oh, Both yeah. That's well, obviously before yeah. Imagine. So yeah, yeah, it was before me. Yeah, episode 65. The show has changed since then, and I expect you have as well. Well, I like to think so. I don't know if my wife thinks so, but. <laughs> <laughs> so I do have to ask, though, have you been listening to the show, if not regularly, on and off since you were last on? Oh, yeah, regularly. Yep. Often at night as I lay down to go to sleep. So I usually miss the last 20 minutes or so of each one. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah. I think you get some really strange dreams about conquering things. I've had those dreams, too. A couple of times in Civ Four, when I was still learning, I would like dream about axe rushing. I'd frequently screw it up, which is really annoying. But you know, it was fun to conquer stuff like that, and then wake up and then be like, "Oh, I didn't do that. Well, I better do it then." All right. So, Polycast Dojo Boys Lullaby is that? That's what you're saying. We are. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah. I, I take you guys to bed with me every night. Now who's familiar with everything? Just the way we like it. <laughs> now who's too comfortable with us? <laughs> Would you like some videos about Rising Tide? Because I think it's about time for Rising Tide. The tide is high and we're holding on. Embark on a bold new journey in Rising Tide, the upcoming expansion to civilization beyond Earth. Rising Tide introduces new ways to explore, colonize, and conquer as you shape a new vision for humanity on an alien planet. The official thing is just basically a trailer. There really isn't a lot of new information in that. No. It's just, as you said, it's it's a trailer. It's a voiceover. Yeah, shiny trailer with a nice voiceover. The diplomacy overview was a much more informative video. Hello, everyone. I'm David Hinkle here in the 2K live stream room, and I'm joined by Andrew Fredrickson. Hello, everyone. The lead producer on Civilization Beyond Earth, Rising Tide. Yeah, because I finally got to see the thing for the first time that shows you with the uh, trying to unlock perks with the hybrid. You know, when they're first talking about hybrid affinities, I thought they were going to make like three new separate ones that were the combination. But really, it's just X slash Y because you're doing part of this and part of that. I don't know. Minor quibble. I wish it had a unique name to them or something. Oh, I'm sure we can squish together like harmony and supremacy in some sort of amalgam term. Yeah. But we'll make it sound like Neapolitan ice cream or something. <laughs> supremacy. Yeah, but- yeah, I thought they were going for something like, take the two ideologies, put it together, and you can give them a, not what you're talking about, like squishing the two names together, but its own separate entity. It calls back to a previous episode, ha ha ha, when we talked about Beyond Earth, probably a couple months after it came out, there was a thread that talked about new victory conditions, if it did hybrid. Mm. Um, so the only question is, did they follow that and actually add in more victory conditions because of the hybrids, or... Are they just little bonuses that you get? Yeah, like maybe some culture, improving culture per turn or something. Yeah, more details would be needed. But way back when, when we talked about it, having a hybrid affinity 
being your top. It did sound like it'd be much more interesting if there was different victory conditions for each based on the different combinations. Then as you say that, just jumping ahead briefly to some written previews, there was a preview on Hardcore Gamer, June the 30th, by Kevin Dunsmore, who talked with the team at Firaxis, and he asked, are there any new victory conditions in Rising Tide? We don't have any specific new victory conditions, but I think that embedded it right there. We don't have any specific new victory conditions. That doesn't necessarily mean that the existing victory conditions have not been tweaked. Hmm. But to what extent, we don't know. Uh, it sort of feels like it's half-assed that you put in new hybrids, but you don't expand out the playstyle so that you really could go full-on hybrid and get cool stuff that way, or do cool stuff to expand the game. I think that's what I was trying to get at earlier. Is, you know, yeah. I was just focusing on the name part of the thing, but I thought they would be more uniqueness to the combined factions instead of you're just getting some perks from over here and some perks from over there and not getting penalized for following like two affinities instead of one. Yeah. I mean, between the video previews and the written previews, other than acknowledging that there are hybrid affinities and, oh, look at this, you get access to some new units that uh, you otherwise would not be able to if you just went a pure affinity, <laughs> whether that's purity or otherwise. I really haven't talked about that specifically or how that really works with existing mechanics, modified mechanics, anything like that. Looks like you can upgrade units based on the, the hybrids. Like, even your base units get hybrided. That kind of takes from the base game where, you know, if you had high level in this and low level in that, then you get a slightly different one. But these ones seem slightly more focused, at least on the unit side, and different than previously. It seems like they wanted to do the hybrid stuff, but didn't really want to do the full hybrid stuff that would have probably made this better. July 22nd was a big day for not just new official videos on the Official Civilization YouTube channel, but lots and lots of previews, almost like an embargo was lifted or something. I, I don't know. I was it? <laughs> <laughs> They're really focusing on, hey, look, cities here in the water. You can find them. And hey, diplomacy, it's relevant. Hey, listen. <laughs> so I'm not entirely sure how diplomacy is more relevant now. But... Well, that's their position it's different <laughs> it, it's not like it was before which for the most part is probably not a bad thing because what it was before was pretty bad do we get to stop but, hearing about adam smith all the time for the love of god please stop talking about adam smith <laughs> <laughs> or no village was ever ruined by trade if i hear that uh, one more time i'm gonna burn the village yep. <laughs> And I've also enjoyed, just as an aside, seeing a number of previews say, Sivbert sounds so friendly. Let's refer to it as Sivbert. And I'm like, yes! yes. Uh, More of that. Writing. <laughs> yes, that. Sivbert. Writing. We were introduced to the North Sea Alliance, not that NSA, <laughs> as referred to <laughs> in the video. Never, ever. We played as NSA. <laughs> yeah. So this is the second of four factions. We now know details about them. And it confirms, I was going to say confirms, it answers the question about so, with being able to have cities in the water, are there any factions, either new or modified old, that are going to be able to go right into the water right away? Yes, that would be the NSA. Yeah, you, anytime a new mechanic pops up, there's almost always a sieve that uses it, or a faction in this case. You got the leader, Duncan Hughes. Aquatic cities have 50% more combat strength and cost 50% less to move. Woohoo! Aircraft carriers. Ooh. <laughs> Especially that latter one. I'm like, ooh. I did like the confirmation that water cities cannot be moved onto land. Aww. <laughs> I would hope. And from the outset, even though the NSA, in this case, could settle in the ocean, they would not be able to go into deep water. That requires an additional technology. They would not be able to do that from the outset. Moving city onto a new hex in this process, it would destroy the improvement, but not the resource. Moving suspends city production. And I'm thinking, well, yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So now it's a trade-off. Do I want to move? And if I want to move, am I going to be farther ahead than not because I can't be constructing a unit of building a wonder, some such? The other thing that I actually particularly liked about the diplomacy overview was they talked more, yeah, about the diplomatic capital, but also about the agreements that you can get. The diplomatic capital, diplomatic capital, you accrue that by constructing uh, some buildings, Saw some modified ones a little later on. Buildings that we know about now also give you diplomatic capital. They've got an upfront cost, followed by a per turn upkeep. Some are gated so that you won't be able to get certain agreements unless you are cooperative or allied, while others just get improved by the relationship status. Like you can be at neutral and get them. First one that I saw was with uh, Alfla, the leader of one of the, actually the first new faction that we learned about. Uh, movement speed on roads and mangrails increased by 30%. 
She would like that from you as the NSA in the diplomacy video. And you get three diplomatic capital per turn. And so now the question is, is that a good deal for me? Is three diplomatic capital per turn enough for what you are getting? And if your relationship improves, for example, then that 30% would go to 45. Is that also a good deal? So I like the, not just talking about it, but showing examples and then showing the questions you need to be asking yourself and the questions the AI needs to be asking itself for that matter in terms of what do I do with this diplomatic capital? You know, we don't want a situation where I have all of this faith in Civilization Five, yet I can't do anything more with it because I've constructed all the buildings and I don't need any more great profits or they cost too much. And I haven't got to the era that lets me get other great profits or I didn't open a policy tree that lets me have other things than great profits. Mm -hmm. The only thing I can think of is there is a limit to the number of services you can get, which means at some point you're going to have chosen all the good ones. So there is a potential point in the game, depending if you can do stuff with the uh, diplomatic capital with other stuff. If you can't, then there is going to be a point in the game where you're like, I like all my traits and all my services. Then you just start stacking it up because you can't do anything with it unless there is stuff to do with it. A rising tide let's play again with Dave Hinkle, but also from the 2K production department, Miles Murphy and Clay Norman. One of the gentlemen commented that later in the game, although this was not defined more specifically, you can use diplomatic capital to purchase buildings and units. Ooh. Yeah, and that's something... You could go sort of an isolationist direction through the buildings and the units to gain diplomatic capital. I'm just curious, what kind of victory type, how's that going to play out? Can you turn that into a powerful approach? Well, it's, well, it's a question of how are you getting the diplomatic capital? What's the thing that's going to get you the most diplomatic capital? Having people pay for your services? Uh, like. Is it your buildings? Is it something else? Like what's driving that gain? And if it's mostly going to be based off services from other people, you assume that there's only so much city spam building stuff that should be able to get you out there. You need enough to be able to start buying services from other people or traits and stuff like that to be able to pay for stuff. But one would assume that the system would be built in such a way that you would need to be friendly with other people to have them pay for your stuff so that you can pay for other people's stuff and actually have some form of diplomacy. Yeah, going on there. I mean, historically, like the aspect of cultural diffusion, I mean, it's always been more beneficial. I think it would follow that in yeah. gameplay. I mean, you could be physically isolated from other people, either by circumstance, map type, or you just kind of choose in the AI chooses not to settle towards you. You choose not to settle towards them. But at the same time, it's not like in Civilization Five, where it's, oh, I'm over here on this continent by myself. I guess when I find you, we can start talking or you find me, whereas in this case, you might be halfway across the map from another faction, but you're in contact with them. And the, yeah, as Majin was saying, the hope is that even if you want to be physically isolated, that you're not ignoring the diplomacy because you could <laughs> take that international contact and do something very isolationist with it that you decide, you know what? I want to go to the Emancipation Gate. I do not want to conquer the world. I'm here to defend myself but I'm really not interested in that kind of interaction. And then you end up using this improved diplomacy system to do whatever it is that you want to do, which I think just using the diplomacy system might, some people might argue, the revised diplomacy system is that good, but hey, at least we're using it more and realize that it actually exists, which arguably could be an improvement from Vanilla Beyond Earth. Hmm. Yeah, one assumes that a diplomacy system is meant to be used, not... You, yes. <laughs> And the diplomacy system is going to allow you to see the relationship status between other factions, which is something that has been asked for and wondering, why can't we tell that in Vanilla Beyond Earth? And it is noted that the AI, that they have their own flavor of personality traits they can choose from. That's something else that's touched upon very briefly in this uh, diplomatic video. They have the same catalog to choose from, but they will have their own flavor. And of course, if you went random personalities or something, all that gets thrown out the window. Once you're in contact with them, you'll be able to know, okay, this is what you have adopted. This is your base trait that doesn't change. This is what you have invested your diplomatic capital in, which is broken up into four different types. Character, domestic, political, and uh, military. And as you get more diplomatic capital through your agreements, through the construction of buildings that now have this, you're going to be able to invest more. And we're not going to go through all the specific examples and the percentages. 
but you could have more combat strength and less movement costs for your cities. You could have more production. You could be getting more health. You could be getting more culture and more energy or yields from international trade routes. Military units get more experience. Science is also possible through this accumulation of diplomatic capital to really tailor what it is that you want to do. I mean, you might be the North Sea Alliance in 10 different games, and you've got this base characteristic that we talked about, but depending upon what you're trying to do and trying to respond to in-game situations, you can have, well, a hybrid of these things, just like to go with the affinities. More depth. This is good. I thought about sort of how the social engineering from uh, Alpha you know, Smack kind of meets the unit workshop in a sense. If I mean, you're doing this to your society instead. Right. It's part of the question of are these permanent? Like if you pick one, can you change it? Because if you can, then that's cool too because you can do something for the beginning of the game and then switch it out and do something for the next part of the game. In the YouTube comments, one gamer 13 did say, finally, a diplomacy system that's more in-depth than either making a trade agreement or denouncing someone. Hopefully they don't mess it up somehow. Oh, well. Yeah, no. <laughs> Obviously, there's a lot more about choosing when do you equip your traits, when do you... Right. Do you spend your diplomatic capital on buying agreements? Do you spend it on buying your traits? Mm -hmm. So more people... You'll have more agreements to offer, so more people will buy in with you. Right. There's going to be a lot of theory crafting going on and arguments over which is the right way to do it or which right. is the best way, and that's sort of the lifeblood of a Civ game. Is, that is Civ, yeah. indeed. <laughs> Everyone's got the right way to do it, and everyone else does it wrong. <laughs> Water cities don't get... to. Uh, culture growth so the local get new hexes from culture doesn't happen anymore and as long as you're moving to an edge you get at least three tiles at a time so you grow by moving your city so not by culture you can't buy tiles though yeah yeah you can still buy tiles want to send a lot of production trade routes to it and get its production up and basically do a big circle with your city uh, yeah, before, you actually, before you stop to actually do a city, that seems kind of weird and gamey. But they made up for the culture not used for border growth by making water cities give more culture towards virtues. It's odd. I, I have a feeling we're going to end up with weird situations. Like you build a new city, you run it all over the map to make the space, and then you stop where you want it and uh, actually do real stuff with it. I can picture just settling a city a few hexes off from where you want it to be, but that encompasses resources, and then like buying one hex, and then you're done. You just work those tiles. Mm. Maybe some specs. I say it's interesting because we talk about this, you're not going to be able to get culture from aquatic cities like you would land cities, and so it's a matter of, okay, what few hexes am I going to be able to get of land, and then being able to buy hexes. In the Polygon interview, Fredrickson said, your water city is going to have a harder time getting food, but you'll have an easier time getting culture and energy. You can balance it out. How do I want to approach the problem this time? And I also found it interesting that he phrased it as, how do I want to approach the problem? Hmm. So... There should be an answer. There should be a solution, apparently. I don't know if problem is the word. After all, he said, water gameplay is not better or worse. It's just different. I don't know, actually, because in the GameSpot interview, it worse. he suggests a gameplay style that seems really bad. So if you travel a lot this way, i.e. moving around your city, you do risk leaving improvements behind. Oh, well. So the natural resources remain. So you can put natural resources in your culture border as you run around and collect them all. And then no one else can have them. And then when you improve them, i.e. strategic resource stuff, you'll get access to them even if it's not in your territory anymore or specifically near a city. There are advantages to sacrificing improvements in the name of mobility that you may not have anticipated. Saying there are circumstances where that's a good decision because you want to move your capital city up to the front, but it's got really good defense and really strong. So you want to guard those traits that no one comes in without his say-so, blah, blah, blah. Whereas other people may choose to just paint a small little circle that they can and stay within it, and that's fine too. But, and this is where things start seeming horribly gamey, you can paint it along, and one of my favorite things is to hug a coastline, paint all the way up it, and purchase colonists and drop them behind me like popping little cities. That sort of sounds like all the hexes you get from moving your city stay. So yeah. if you drive your city Say you're on a continent's map. You start in the water. You drop a city, bump it up, let it move. You then do a circle of the continent. <laughs> now no one who lands on the continent can use the coastline. Oh. And you have all of that ringed. 
for your own. Mm. You do, but you're also sacrificing sort of the exponential benefit from moving that city around. No, but you have the one city doing that. You have your capital doing the normal stuff and then you can kick out other cities. <sighs> Sounds risky. That culture border is tied to that one city, right? Well, then you go hide it behind a bunch of other cities because it's movable. <laughs> yeah, but we're not talking a couple turns here. We're talking like 100 plus turns if you really want to circle a continent so, with one city. So if you lose that water city, you lose those tiles. Not only do you lose those tiles, your opponent gets all of them. <laughs> yeah. If it's, I'm understanding this correctly. But that to me just <laughs> sounds a little goofy. I would goofy, just... it's lousy, but like I don't think most players will do it because I don't think it's that strong of an advantage for what you're doing. Depends. If you're on continent's map, you could probably lock in a couple of the more aggressive ones on that continent, and then they can't do anything. And then you can drop cities all over the place because it's all your territory. I Isn't guess. Or you could just put the hammers in the boats and kill them all. Eh, who knows? How many hammers does it take to move a naval city? Based on these descriptions, I'm convinced it's a gamble. And the question is, what are the stakes? And I think the stakes could be very high, but are they typically going to be very high? Or is it not going to be? And I'm pretty certain we're going to actually have to play this to answer that question. But it is interesting that the lead producer is talking about this particular approach, which then gets us to start to think... What he's talking about is like he's recommending it. And if he's recommending it, then is that really something that should be? (laughs) Yeah, see, my assumption would be if you move your city, that's all good. But any hexes that you gained would disappear if there are more than three hexes away from your city. That'd be reasonable. So you'd have a trail of three hexes behind Uh... your city that you would keep, but it would prevent painting the coast. Option. Unless you are buying those colonists. Yeah, well, oh, sure, if you make enough cities, but... Yeah. It kind of makes me think, like, in Civilization Five, it's, okay, this city, it's not a capital, it's, it's not a city-state, I'm going to raise it. I'm going to be giving up these improvements here by resettling somewhere else, but that's okay, because I'm going to be farther ahead. If it's far enough away and someone else wants to settle a city there, and that's already been improved, then they can pick up and they can use it. I don't suddenly then still be able to use it because at one point it was mine, even though it's that much farther away on the map. Yeah, I would assume that it'd just be smarter to uh, have the system give up the hexes if they're outside of three. That way you can move your cities all around and do all your fun stuff, but you're not metagaming the game by painting the coastline. Although that sort of tells me that you could also do rings around stations. Uh, oh, yeah. So you could just, instead of putting a bunch of units around it, just send your city around it and lock it up with your uh, culture border. I think that's certainly plausible because it is noted that stations can settle in the water now, too. Oh. <laughs> so you can actually protect it by putting it in, inside your borders. Hmm. Yes, you can uh, extend your shields. Yeah. As it were. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on, Mac. You knew a Star Trek reference was going to happen. Yeah. You don't go an episode of that one. There is a comment also. How will respect and fear function in multiplayer? Is the only way to improve relationships <laughs> through fear? <laughs> the same way they do now? Yeah, the, the respect and fear function, even how that works in single player, you just get kind of a generic, well, if they respect you, they're going to be more likely to want to deal with you. And if they fear you, maybe you're going to be able to extort something out of them, but they're really not going to be in a cooperative mood. Really haven't seen too much in terms of how that actually works in gameplay just yet. Not that I came across, anyway. And then another official video, Planetfall in Rising Tide with Quill 18, also released on the 22nd of July. Like something had been lifted, right? From that, and it's not just from this video, but when I was looking through these things, I actually started with the uh, video. And of course, ooh, I can take a screenshot from this video, and now I know about this information, because you know how we are. Aliens look and behave different on each biome. Mm. Also came up in uh, some of the uh, written previews. Get back to that in a moment. Artifacts. I think in terms of the focus, it's water and then diplomacy and then artifacts. I know it was an earlier episode. Might have even been the the last episode wasn't on. Of course, it was commented that one of the artifacts is Senor Caffeine. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) And they were showing what you could get if you just use that by itself. And then that also showed a speech compression computer. Uh, These are both old Earth artifacts, nothing alien or progenitor. In fact, I haven't seen any previews what examples of artifacts are that are alien or progenitor. They've been all old Earth. 
and also a later a high mass friction welder. Like for example, that by itself could be 40 production. But if you combine it with senior caffeine and the speech compressor computer, you got 42 production, you got plus five science. And because you've had all three, it's not just two, because it's three, you unlock the Xenomass bathhouse, which gives you plus one culture and units heal 100% after one turn in a city. And I enjoyed the humor in the description of this. I don't know why I was reading it, but it was uh, come experience true exfoliation. <laughs> the only thing that's not explained, though, about the artifacts, and maybe someone else came across it, how this impacts, the senior caffeine was listed as battered condition. Mm. The high mass friction welder is noted as worn, and the speech compression computer is listed as pristine. So I'm hoping that what that means is if you found a, like a pristine high mass friction welder, you wouldn't get plus 40 production. You would get plus 50 as an example. But that's not really mm. explained. That's just mm. an inference by what we're seeing on screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or is it, you know... Related to coffee makers going to be much older. Could it just be a filler? No. I mean, it could be like it's always going to be worn for use. But I would assume that these three different qualities of artifacts would translate to either, like Dan was saying, higher yields. So the same artifact, different quality, gives different yield. Or it could be that the, the average level or whatever of the artifacts that you use gives you this building or that building or wonder or whatever, what you actually get out of adding all three. Like if it's all perfect and pristine, then you should probably get something better than if you put three together that were all like worn and broken. Or maybe both. Has there been any mention about trading artifacts? Mm, not that I've seen. No, no. No, so you're trying to think like that great works? Yeah. yeah. Mm. No, haven't seen anything yet. I mean, that could be something they could do and tie that into the new the relationship status, the neutral, cooperative, allied, how willing they would be to trade, mm -hmm. how good trades you could possibly get <laughs> using diplomatic capital in order to be able to maybe kind of nudge someone towards, hey, mm. how about I throw this in too? In addition to our good relationship, you give me this artifact, I give you that artifact. Yeah. Or something. Or something. Someone mentioned seeing a nest, an alien nest on Firaxite, which means it's, hmm. it's not just on... Oh. The, the Xenomass? Yeah. Uh -huh. That could be useful if it actually showed up on all three, so that supremacy and purity don't get a free pass. Like, here's a bunch of stuff, and you don't have to deal with aliens because all the Xenomass is over there. I hope so. Either that or it's, oop, sorry for that graphical error. We fixed it. That's not a thing. <laughs> I never felt like the, the Xenomass was that difficult to handle, though. No, it's not, but, I mean, if you look at a map, anybody who goes Harmony and Mass Xenomass is going to have to deal with a lot of Ness. Anybody who went Supremacy or Purity with a lot of Floatstone or Fraxite did not have to deal with a lot of Ness. That's true, all. although that's part of Harmony's flavor. If they just mm. made Harmony a little bit, uh, well. Well, they can leash aliens now, so. Yeah. So at least that's slightly more flavorful. But yeah, I mean, if the nests are on everything, then everybody has to choose to deal with or not the aliens. It just seems a little contrived, but that's okay. It's not a big deal either way. I think it's more balanced and more natural. Balanced, it's, lol. Yeah. And then in terms of the videos, this almost two-hour Let's Play Civilization Beyond Earth Rising Tide, that's Alpha Law, there was a war later on in the game, and it showed us after war was declared, going back to the diplomacy screen... War score. Oh. War score. War score. Europa, the term Europa sounds Europa. familiar. <laughs> Where have I heard say. the term war score before? Yeah. <laughs> EU, EU. Also with that, in that situation, it was 22 to 0, and it was mentioned that there's no clear victor, neither gain any spoils, white peace. Wow. Uh, it probably these depends. terms sound familiar. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah. Don't they? It probably depends on the scale. Like, if... 25 is the max. Oh, yeah, the numbers. And, like, I've kicked your butt. Or Out it, of context yeah, don't mean much. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If, it's, if it's a standard 100, then yeah, 22%, even in EU4, isn't much. I mean, Although it's more than the minimum. On a 100-point scale, 22% is starting to lean one way Yeah, pretty uh, significantly, if it's tuned well. I mean, it's not a guaranteed win, but you're starting to see one side starting to pull away a bit if you're having that kind of war score, usually. So if it's 22 out of 100, there's no clear winner, but the one side that has 22, especially when the other is zero, might actually gain something, even if it's token. Yeah, you would expect some sort of token, like an artifact. <laughs> Give me your artifact. Pristine. A pristine artifact. <laughs> Only pristine. You <laughs> can just troll the other human players, declare with some mobile units while they're fighting another one, pillage all their tiles, and then peace out. 
<laughs> uh, yeah, I guess if it is War Score, we should really find out what gives War Score. Yeah. If pillaging improvements gives War Score. Then, oh dear. And you can have fast workers. <laughs> and, and, and you pull off the Civ 5 pillage, repair, pillage, repair. And that actually gets yeah. oh, because it's in somebody else's territory. Yeah. Oh, uh, that'd be so broken. <laughs> I'm going to stability hit you with this peace offer. Lol, lol, lol. <laughs> <laughs> what did you do? Well, all war, I saw this building over here, so I burned it down, fixed it up, burned it down, <laughs> fixed it up. <laughs> yeah, we just repeatedly burned our academy. Your people hate us for this. You ah. can take, like, eight cities because of all the war score you got from Phil's repairing one hex. <laughs> yes, yeah, so how is war score calculated? Big question mark. Probably going to be unit kills that would, and cities taken. That would be my I, I guess, but... In the Polygon article, at, at one point, the writer Colin Campbell says that although Fraxis says the AIs themselves have been improved, the real change here is one of transparency. With all this additional data, players are less likely to be blindsided by AI's seeming craziness. But will the AI be able to handle our craziness? <laughs> Never can. Well, I do like the fact that I'm actually going to have something to look at to tell how close I am to getting them to give me what I started the war for. That they're willing to give this and that, and it's, you know, a matter of I just need to do a little bit more to get them to give up what I wanted. Because sometimes it's hard to tell, you know, how I'm doing fine on my own. Oh, yeah, as opposed to like in Civilization Five, where, okay, yeah, there's this dark green, and there's this light green, and there's but this... What does that mean? Dark red and light red. The fear and respect they talked about before, just looking also at the Polygon interview, both of these factors are played as numeric scales. So I guess you'll also have to get used to, in a way, okay, how, how much better is it that this faction fears me at 5 versus 10? What does that translate into possibilities? Mm -hmm. From other first hands-on previews, there's a lot of general stuff, uh, but the Polygon interview does mention one thing. This is one change to something very specific and something very near and dear to a lot of players' hearts. And this is a good change, but it's also kind of one of those things where I think a lot of us are just going to have to get used to it. Interesting tweak to the ultrasonic fence. Uh-oh. Previously, researching this wall was a no-brainer as, as it kept aliens off settled lands. Now it's slightly less effective. Really, really angry aliens can mm. now breach the ultrasonic fence. Yay! <laughs> Ooh. We'll see if it makes a big difference in actual gameplay or not. Well, yeah, as what's long the level as... of pissed off they have to get to breach the fence? Yeah, I mean, if they're at green and they don't constantly wander directly into your cities and eat your workers then good if they're red they should just grab a seed room and ride it in go cause trouble and if they're orange then they should just hang out around the outside of your uh, territory rather than like all the way in maybe pillage a few tiles on the edges i mean that would make more sense so that you can't just go more 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 make you all mad and sit there at the edge of my fence and shoot you, which is a common thing. <laughs> hey, look, my ranger is shooting this poor siege room who is one hex away, but can't seem to get in to do anything about it. <laughs> if you're, you know, killing the aliens as well, and they're turning orange and red, you know, what does that do to the other players? Uh, I think from base beyond Earth, the, the overall explanation was that there was, the aliens had both, uh, hate on for like a number for you and a number globally so if you kill a lot of the aliens they'll get mad at you but they'll slowly get mad at everybody that was the base in beyond earth and unless they say anything different it'll probably be similar my only concern is water-based cities kraken yeah i was gonna say would you like several dozen krakens on your doorstep yeah, that could be well, arranged. Well, my concern on that one is because the whole blockaded area for water cities, like water tiles themselves, Seed Room goes onto a single land tile, it blocks that one land tile. Kraken wanders up to your coastal city, at least in Beyond Earth, you lose that tile and two to three range around it. Oh, yeah, you could be yeah. so opposed if you got one or two of those blocking all your cities completely, you won't be able to work any tiles, and because you can't work any tiles, you won't be able to do anything about it. And die. Yeah. <laughs> And if they're mad and they break through the ultrasonic fence, <laughs> yeah, you could have swarms, especially since naval aliens are way faster than the other ones. So you could have a swarm of sea dragons just pop up or a swarm of krakens pop up out of nowhere and just destroy all your ability to feed your people or anything 
for a couple I'm guessing turns. the devs have some sort of countermeasure in for that, because I, I doubt that they're all playing at, at a level such that they can afford investing into stopping that kind of stuff and still like, have fun just playing the game. Yeah, and I guess the real question, fence side of it was never really the uh, the thing that made the ultrasonic fence powerful. It was, did they change the quest for trade units? <laughs> Are trade units still blatantly immune? Yes. Because that's the real reason to pick or to put up a, an ultrasonic fence or two. Right. Yeah. yeah. If that still exists, then who cares if they can come onto my land? My trade units are perfectly fine. <laughs> Especially your water-based ones. Yep. Yeah. Otherwise, just in terms of some bits of information from the, the hands-on previews, Dan Stapleton at IGN said he got to play the first 130 turns as the North Sea Alliance which maybe explains with regards to some of the affinity paths, for example, not having enough turns to be able to explore that. Although he did say the unit upgrade screen has been completely redesigned with a concentric circle display that shows the tiers of possible upgrades along the three affinity paths. Didn't get the chance to play with it, but he got to see some of the details. And the tech web has also been revised with color coding of texts that give you access to buildings, units, and affinity points. So it kind of pops out on the screen. Thank you. A little bit better where it is that you... A little less bland. A little, uh, yeah, a little less bland. The Hardcore Gamer (laughs) interview also asked some of those questions that are just kind of like, hee hee. There are no new technologies to tie with the tech web first off, but we rebalanced the tech web and added more to it where certain things are and expanding the contents of some of the technologies. And then, still no plans for PlayStation 4 or Xbox One? Bye! Because <laughs> that's a real huge question. strategy for him, yeah. Uh, I'm like, uh... So the response the response I liked was, the team at Fraxis says, laughs. Can you imagine trying to port this game? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I can. I would have been tempted to ask, not about consoles, be like, so PC and Mac versions releasing at the same time, <laughs> able to communicate with each other? Yes? No? Maybe? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been a better question, I think. Maybe. <laughs> there was a couple mentions like, where they talked about the nodes, visibility nodes that you can come across and light up sections of the map. Oh. I don't know exactly what you'd have to do to turn them on. Maybe you just find them, roll over them. But I thought that was a pretty neat concept to have available that would open up the map for you. So they finally gave us something to get out of those pods that's literally a map? <laughs> Yeah, through quests, though. This is through quests. Oh, yeah. okay, okay. Oh, uh, okay. So it could be, like, map-related quest, like the type biome slash whatever stuff on the map related. Yeah, could be useful. All of these previews, and especially quills, are based on, like, a really, 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 really buggy version of the game. And it's like, so they didn't do first gameplay with a solid functioning set of features that they can expand on or add to new features. They seem to have just like tossed as much stuff as possible at it and then said, here, go late, take a look at this. It's like, but that's broken. Oh, well, we'll fix it later. I mean, just from the media side of it, those videos will still be on the web when the game yeah. comes out, when the expansion comes out. And if people go, I want to see if Re- Rising Tide is any good. Oh, I see this yeah. video. Oh, it's full of bugs. Crash. Oh, that's buggy, buggy, buggy. Yeah, it could actually lead to negative reactions. Yeah, perhaps I should wait longer before buying this. Yeah. Polygon's Colin Campbell. On the face of it, Rising Tide is about the addition of water-based cities, but it's also about more dialogue, more transparency, more data, more choice to shape one's own character and giving the AI character flavor. Feel like that you're talking to distinct personalities. <laughs> Rather than, oh, you have a name and a color palette. Yep. Good for you. <laughs> yep. Except maybe with yeah. extra Adam Smith quotes. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a quote from Adam Smith's offspring. <laughs> Stop it. The people are the heroes. Now, the heroes, the peasants, now. The we got a private message from one crazy Canadian. He was a guest on episode 226 in April. To sum up, he was asking about the sheer lack of scenarios for Beyond Earth. And that's true. Base Beyond Earth didn't have any. We haven't heard any about rising tides, but then again, it, but the question he actually had is what would be some good ideas for scenarios in Beyond Earth, like if we were going to make scenarios? And then he suggests the easiest one is just reconquering Earth with supremacy victory conditions. So I assume that you pretend that you already did supremacy and that you actually go back to Earth and try and conquer it with advanced units. Yeah, there is a sheer lack of scenarios for Beyond Earth. And 
I assume that's mostly based on the fact that for the main Civ Line games, all the scenarios are based on historical things that happened. So that's really, really easy to come up with a half dozen or a dozen scenarios for like, because, well, history happened and there's lots of stuff to go pick and choose. Whereas this, like, what type of scenario would would you play where you're on the map? Because you can play the scenario of, say, if you go back to Earth and see who gets off Earth first, but then that would be called Civ. (laughs) (laughs) They've done that, yeah. Yeah, it'd be hard to put out an actual scenario that's not just go play the game. Yeah, any sort of scenarios people would think, maybe if if people went into different science fiction games or TV shows or something, they could find something to do there. But that would also almost probably have to be a total conversion on top of that. I think another reason there seemed to be a lack of scenarios for Beyond Earth is uh, let's just look at the Civilization franchise and the popularity of these things. Some of the scenarios have pretty good popularity. Overall, I don't think it's a smart use of resources, so I'm glad that there aren't scenarios. And for that void, let the community, I think the modding community, can do more with that. Well, that's also what he's asking in a sense is why hasn't the modding community started on this yet? Well, more focused on why hasn't the uh, devs done it. But modding community, yeah, they can make scenarios, but it depends on how moddable the under it really is. By Ariacus, or Ariacus, Ariacus came up with a Diplo expansion idea for future games. Given this inspiration, like Gal Civ Three, where an AI just gifted some money as a thank you for giving him trade deals, probably he's not sure, of. and that were more in his favor than uh, players. In other words, he gave the AI favorable trade deals, so the AI gave him some gold. So I was just thinking how cool it would be and how much it could affect the bland diplomacy in Civ 5. It would function in an opposite manner to denunciations, praising someone you deem as an ally and or a good person and get a small diplo bonus, like plus 5 with that Civ, and that can add a bonus penalty with other Civs as well. Then, if possible, expanding it further and letting there be a reason stated with the denunciation or praise, such as greedy land grabber, city state bully, warmonger, betrayer, liar, <laughs> it's city or state a bully. generous, faithful ally, protected mm-hmm. city state, good trading partner. Dark I know how I'm denouncing Dan. I mean, I like the expansion idea, but I kind of like the reason stated more just because it ties in with the existing denunciation. I've told the world that you're not to be trusted. Okay, what about? Yeah. Or either because. Up to this point, either we've been friends or there hasn't been anything going on. You know, no major incidents have shaped our relationship. So what changed? Or you hate me for half a dozen things that I know about. Could you be more specific as to what you really hate about me right now? We all know that Dan is a betrayer. That's why we're denouncing him. We're a steady state bully. Uh, it, it's true. The praising thing is interesting. It's just kind of like, let's have the positive to the negative denunciation. It's flavor. I like the concept. Well, it's plausible. Again, I think what this comes down to is adding a bit more flavor to the diplomacy system. As long as you can't just like constantly go out and praise and praise and praise somebody for like absolutely nothing just to increase your <laughs> relationship yeah. with them. This we guy think is you're great. Awesome. This guy is awesome. He's amazing. Look at this great guy. <laughs> well, that should have negative consequences. <laughs> Some limit to the point where it's like, okay, it falls back and kills you. But yeah, you should be able to have that. And then you can have a more complex web of diplomacy. Like one AI doesn't like another AI because something. But you go and praise that specific AI because they helped somebody else. And those with flavors of the AIs balance that out. And you can have a slightly more complicated web of, well, you like this person for this reason. That person hates that person for that reason. So they can have, hate them for, say, settling up in their face, but then you can like them because they did something else. And the other AIs would approve or disapprove of all of that based on their own interactions. And you know diplomacy could get a lot more complicated. Yeah, that would be great. It'd be like, hey, this person did this. Yeah, I know. Isn't it great? What do you mean? That was an asshole thing to do. <laughs> you praise them for declaring war on somebody else. <laughs> I'll good, praise them as good. war monsters. No, I'll say that they are uh, they're faithful allies and good trading partners over and over and over again. <laughs> the diplomacy text should be, I'm going to praise you like I should. <laughs>
<laughs> Maggie got it. Wow. No. Song reference. <laughs> Song reference. Imagine that. I would never. Uh, never. Except when I. Except all the time. <laughs> I denounce you. And then everybody hates you for denouncing somebody. Meanwhile, what they actually did, everybody hates them for it. Yeah, that's always a little iffy. And then maybe you have to denounce them for something specific. And to declare war without other people getting all mad, they also have to all agree. And it can't be for something stupid. Like, I hate you because your industrial base is crappy. Let's declare war. I hate you because you're trying to win the game in a similar manner to me. Well, yeah. Declaring war because the industrial base is crappy is perfectly reasonable. Hatred <laughs> over it isn't, but <laughs> you don't think this yeah. person can produce military units. And they're a pretty good target, actually. Yeah, you know, everybody else might agree or disagree. That's true. <laughs> we agree. This person's industrial base is crappy. Let's dogpile him. <laughs> yep. <laughs> no, someone else could praise that. Is Your industrial base is so crappy, you make me look even better by comparison. I praise you. Or you're being peaceful. I praise you. First and industrial else, base like, is crappy, so they're not going to win. I'm going to align with them. So they help me win. Maybe you need to praise people a few times before you can be allies. Oh, maybe that's how allies. you get uh, declarations of friendship or even just a basic open borders or something. If you've been nice to them, they're like, oh, all right. Or even research agreements. And then you can have reasons why you praise each other, but then reasons why you denounce each other and still be friends. Recording for episode 231 with Dan Q, Makalua, the me and team, King Morgan, and warning you too. I, Digital Times, rising tide, quote unquote, won't delay Civ 6. And we had talked about these people last September in episode 209. They predicted that Civ 6 would be released in 2015. It's... And now they're expressing disappointment that Civilization VI wasn't announced at E3, but they say Civilization games may not have particularly pretty graphics, but they're still very comprehensive, huge scope, AAA PC games. They take a long time to develop. Civ IV came out in 2005, Civ V in 2010. It's hardly surprising that Civ VI isn't out yet. And I take those two statements, Civ IV 2005, Civ V in 2010, the year difference between them is five years. It's hardly surprising that Civ VI isn't out yet. But it's 2015. Yeah, yeah, but see, if they wait a year, then it's out in 2016. See? Oh. Yeah, see? It took me a moment there. It took me a moment there. My I get where you're going, better, Dan. Yeah, they're usually about five years apart, but, you know, they probably put a little bit of the resources for Beyond Earth, and they've been supporting that. But it's not like they haven't been working on Civ Six this entire time. It's just they're letting Beyond Earth have the spotlight right now, and then next year, that can be for Civ Six. And they're getting as much as they can out of the Civilization V engine with Beyond Earth and Rising Tide, which the person acknowledges such as admirable. But he then says, here's the key. Those people that are doing Beyond Earth and Rising Tide, they aren't the main Civilization team. The team who made Brave New World, oh, the last quote-unquote real Civ V expansion. And I'm thinking, are you trying to say that, that Beyond Earth and now Rising Tide are unreal Civ V expansions? Going back to the whole Beyond Earth is just a Civ V mod? Well, they're, they're not Civ V, so yeah. Because it's based on the same... Anyway, <laughs> they haven't been spotted for some time. <laughs> they're all working on an unannounced project at Firaxis. Jake Solomon is working on XCOM 2, and a different team is making the sci-fi spinoffs as compared to, say, XCOM Enemy Unknown. But it's just like, but nope, Fraxis is working on Civilization VI. With Rising Tide coming out this fall, it's reasonable we won't see Civilization VI in 2015. But next year, it's nearly a sure thing. They've been working on it for years. We don't know what about it, but it's long underway and obviously coming. I mentioned this more as just a follow-up because, hey, they went out and they acknowledged we were wrong. We're calling ourselves on it that we're not going to be getting Civilization VI this year. And some people might argue you do realize the year isn't even half over yet. But he's springboarding it off of, yeah, but it wasn't announced at E3 and they already talked about Rising Tide coming out this fall. And clearly there's XCOM 2 work being done as well. So there's only so many people at the company, dot, 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 dot. Some inference is still there, but Mackie's point about Civilization Civilization 6 in 2016, mm -hmm. they should market that. But I really think the main marketing for Civilization 6, if and when it comes out, is the debate between sticking with Roman numerals and going to integers. I've said this before, there needs to be many threads on this between now and a possible Civ 6, because it's very, very important. Dump the Roman numerals. Do you go with tradition, or do you shake things up? Because, you know, kids these days, they don't know what Roman numerals are. <laughs> There, I'm generalizing. <laughs> the Roman numerals. Would you like to talk about how you used to have to go uphill in the snow and all that? I remember when clocks were analog, I tell you what. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Have you ever tried Flash? going uphill in the snow and skis? It sucks. Reward for episode 230 with Dan Q, Makalua, to me and Team, Mad Jin, and Carl5872. <laughs> Top 10 video game menu themes. Let's go already! Made by WatchMojo.com. For this list, we've chosen our entries based on a combination of the entry's popularity as well as how long it will stick in your mind. Usual stuff. A, little, a couple I've never heard of, like One Must Fall 2097 is number 10, for example. But you got your Sonic, you've got your Mega Man 2 on there. Halo, of course, makes an appearance. But Deus number X, one. the original one. Yeah. Number one is uh, Civ 4's Baba Yetu. Baba Yetu is the main theme of Civ 4 and plays over the opening video. The track is beautifully sung by Ron Ragan and the Soweto Gospel Choir. Fun fact, you might actually know the lyrics already, since it's technically just the Lord's Prayer, only in Swahili. Baba Yetu was eventually recognized for its genius, as it became the first piece of video game music to be nominated for a Grammy in 2010, and was even performed for the United Nations General Assembly. Part of episode 231 with Dan Q, Makalua, the me and team, King Morgan, and warning you too. What I found interesting was Minecraft was voted down by a lot of people as not being that difficult, but I find the absence of EU4 is kind of mysterious. I thought that was a fairly difficult game. Well, um, well let's separate difficulty from steep learning curve, because difficulty is how hard a game is to play, whereas a steep learning curve is how much effort you need to put into the game in order to learn how to play it at all. Well, that's a good point. And those Which are is two why... different things. I, I actually disagree, despite loving Dark Souls, with putting it number one on a steep learning curve list. I probably wouldn't put it number one on a difficulty list either, although it, w- it is a very difficult game, and it would make a top ten of mine, I think, if I were to fabricate one. But... As far as steep learning curve, not really. Its controls are pretty fluid, and there's not a whole lot to learn. You have to be really careful or you're going to die a lot. But by and large, from a conceptual standpoint, it's not that difficult to learn how to play the game. Now, playing it at a master level is difficult for any game, so I don't think that like being a PvP master is what we're measuring here in Dark Souls or in any of the other games. Compared to Europa Universalis, which is a lot more, like, little mechanics here and there to learn, it has a much less steep learning curve. The description in the video beyond the title... While not necessarily the hardest games out there, these titles thrust you straight into the action, expecting you to adapt, crash, and burn. These are the titles that require a vast array of knowledge in order to become competent at. Yeah, speaking of crash and burn, that's exactly why Kerbal Space Program is in here. <laughs> yeah. Number five. Yeah, Kerbal Space Program is good. Civ is good. StarCraft, they, they do ease you in a little bit, actually. But, I mean, okay, I guess it's number ten on the list. So, whatever. Number nine, Fire Emblem series. Number eight, Arma 3. I laughed at number seven, XCOM. You could probably oh, okay. inch up <laughs> like, the tactical stuff uh, a little bit more, because there, there's it, actually a lot of underlying mechanics in those. As it doesn't take too long to learn that 90% means you're going to miss. Yeah. Well, oh, yeah. Now, XCOM should be a, a top ten video games with steep learning curves you'll never get over. Uh, <laughs> number six, EVE Online. <laughs> uh, spreadsheets in Space, the game. Yeah. I thought that was Master of Orion 3. Oh, no, my bad. <laughs> oh, you just worry of us. <laughs> Monster Hunter series number four, and then the one we haven't mentioned, Dota 2, is in number two. Yes. Oh, and there were three honorable mentions. There was the Wonderful 101, Dwarf Fortress, and my favorite entry, actually on the whole list, was the Sim City series. Not because it was on the list, not because it was an honorable mention, but because it lists its end life as 2013, <laughs> 1989 <laughs> to 2013. <laughs> uh, yeah. Loved it. <laughs> yeah, how did Dwarf Fortress not get on there? That is really hard to learn. In my mind, that's a lot steeper than most of the games on the top ten. Yeah. And I've played a good chunk of the games. And he only keeps making it more complex. Yeah. 
I mean, I could beat Dark Souls in under three hours, even now. But run a dwarf fortress the wall. Yeah, I would not put it number one on a steep learning curve. It doesn't belong there. Easy to pick up, hard to master, I guess. Yeah, and you're going to die a lot because it's it's very punishing of basic mistakes. Still, like you know what the game is, you you know how to play it. You might know not know what that enemy in front of you does, but you could probably guess that it's going to kill you very quickly if you let it hit you, just like the other fifty enemies you killed before it. Genghis Khan in the original Civ. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yes! <laughs> well, hey, that ties into the next topic, though. Civs that upon discovery are your number one target. <laughs> Speaking of... Your neighbor. You. That's the real answer. Well, true, but everybody's got a different list, different ranking order. If you see this person, yeah. it's a Valatros that posted over on CFC with that, and his top three were Nobunaga, Gandhi, and Austria, because she's so whiny. You, he was talking about you could settle away from her. That's my land. Why are you taking it? Don't be nice to the city states. Those are mine. I, I can see where that would get annoying after a while. I don't know if that makes her a number one target. Ben, so I mean, would you like to uh, have a trade agreement with England, for example? I mean, there's <laughs> sometimes you just don't want to play a game with that this time. You had to have the obligatory Gandhi reference. I mean, that has <laughs> that has transcended just into general gaming lore. Even if you don't play strategy games, I see gaming sites talk about the bloodthirstiness that is Gandhi. It's like, wow, that's like Civ's biggest meme, biggest contribution to the gaming <laughs> world is Gandhi. So I'm like, wow, I don't know how I feel about it that. It fits so well with his message when you beat him, too. <laughs> like when you wipe him out. It's hilarious. As we relayed earlier, I think a lot of memes, there's at least some kind of purpose or intent behind that. But that was a programming freaking error. I just, oh, anyway. <laughs> uh, who, uh, other all the mentions, the Zulus, uh, Hiawatha. Zulus, because, well, otherwise it's going to be you. Oh, my gosh. The Zulu for Civilization Five. they are absolutely at the top of the list. I Not even like Hiawatha. Oh, they're talking no. about Hiawatha likes to spam everywhere. And the Shoshone. I don't know. Uh, Zulu. Definitely the Zulu. Yeah, okay. The Zulu, yeah, sure, the Shoshone take up a lot of land, but they uh, defending that land is another question. And whereas with the Zulu, consistently with those impies, oh my gosh. Even when other human players don't bribe them into war with you in multiplayer. <laughs> <laughs> even in single player. <laughs> man. just oh Still raw, gosh. isn't it, Dan? <laughs> it is. I'll give second to what Chris period. That's his username. Uh, it doesn't actually say Chris period. It's, it's the period symbol, just so we're clear. Greece, keep stealing my city states uh, away. Yeah. Yeah. Really? Seriously? No. Stop it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. From what I recall, it's possible to spec them so you have basically like no decay on influence at all, too. I don't know if the AI does it, but that would oh, be a probably so. If you let Alexander get into the later parts of the game and he just has like a lot cold on those things. Yeah. The backstabbing is real for France from uh, Kevin's <laughs> Yeah, yes. It's true. It would be completely nice to your face, and I shouldn't be surprised at this point because it's France. Call, Call in today. today. In North America, the number is 301-637-7659. That's 301-637-POLY. In Europe, 4412128. 7659. That's 4412128 Polly. The only thing worse than being talked about is not being talked about. For more information on Polycast, our sibling shows Modcast, Revcast, and Turncast, or about Polycast in general, log on to the series official website at thepolycast.net. I think that brings us to the end. I believe it does. <laughs> well, now, Dan, you messed me up, man, because the one part I got was the intro. You took that away from me. Now you have the exit. You have the closing. It's like yeah, I practiced remember, that, but I'm, I didn't practice this. I'm always asleep at the closing. Remember? It's the same as the intro. <laughs> in reverse. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in to episode 234 of Polycast with Dan Q. I will capitalize on our diplomacy. Mad Jen. What, what? Makalua. No, no, don't go there. And the me and team. My water cities will border block you. Thanks for uh, joining us there, Tom. And- Absolutely enjoyed it. Hopefully, hopefully, I'll make every effort, if you'll have me, to be back within 169 episodes. 
<laughs> All right, we'll see you back in 168 episodes. Uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> see you in a couple years, dude, yeah. And let's not even think about how long that will be. Uh, <laughs> and the implication that we will definitely be doing the show that long. <laughs> That's only another five years at our current pace. So. Yeah. Lovely. <laughs> Thanks a lot, you guys. Enjoy. Yeah. Recorded July 25th, 2015. Civilization Beyond Earth Rising, Tide, Clips, Copyright, Take Two Interactive. Watch Mojo, Clips, Copyright, Watch Mojo. Civilization 4, 5, and Beyond Earth Sound Clips, Copyright, Take Two Interactive. Copyright Civilized Communication at civcom.net.